I think the thing I like the most about teaching physics is when I can bring equipment like the monkey gun into the classroom and show, show students physics actually happening, not on a chalkboard, just on a chalkboard, not just projected up as a slide flat, but real, three-dimensional, real physics uh, going on right in front of everyone. The best thing about being a marine agent is that I get to share my love of the water with people. I get to work with a variety of people from young ones all the way up to older ones and I get to take them outside. We get to work with the water and the beaches on boats and fishing. I really love my job. The best thing about working in oil spill response is working with diverse people throughout the world and I mean when you have a small spill you'll you'll work with the local people here but when you have a large spill there's people from all over the world that come in and you're able to work with them. I like interacting with kids to begin with. Uh, they're fun and they always have a different perspective on any subject. My favorite part about teaching fifth grade science is taking the students into the lab and letting them experiment and investigate on their own without leading them too much, giving them the materials and letting them uh, inquire at their own pace. What I like most about my job is bringing the outdoors inside to my students that normally don't get exposed to learning concepts and areas, um, getting them outside of Southeast Texas, bringing the outdoors in to them. The part I like the most about it, I guess, is the variety. Um, there's Every spill is, is different, challenges are different. Um, that's probably the best part about it, the variety. The best thing about working in the oil spill response field is there's, it's never the same twice. There's always a challenge, no matter what oil, no matter what time of the year, there's always a challenge that you have to uh, overcome and it just it makes it a real exciting field. Well, what I love about my job are these people here, the students that we worked with. Uh, that they always keep me on my toes. Bringing in my experiences in making science real and uh, clearing up the misconception that scientists don't always wear lab coats and live in a lab. You know, have a vision of what you want to do. And I had a vision of working in the oil spill industry after seeing the Exxon Valdez. I already had my background in school and I always, already had my background in work and I was working at the time for oil spill equipment manufacturer, but we were just manufacturing the equipment and selling it to the companies. So I worked in and knowing the right people and having to be at the right place to help me get my job. Physics can be a difficult subject and people don't just learn it linearly, they don't learn it gradually, they learn it in leaps and bounds. 
And uh, a lot of times it's just explaining a one example just the right way that gets a student to understand it. And that can be very satisfying. To be a Coastal Marine Resource Agent, you have to have a master's degree in a related field. And so my degrees are in biology, plus I have a teaching certificate, and I have a lot of lifetime experience in fishing and boating and aquaculture. I was in the oil spill cleanup business for about 11 years. I was an actual contractor for about 11 years before I joined the, the Texas General Land Office. I actually started in the Coast Guard. I was doing this for uh, six and a half years in the Coast Guard before I started college. And then I started college and found out about this job here. So with my, with, with my training there in my uh, college experience, it made it easier for me to get the job in this field. And I'm a hydrometeorological technician and my actual title here is observing program leader. Now I got my meteorology when I was in the Air Force and part of the stuff I used to do was like uh, weather briefings for things like the SR-71. The most favorite thing I do in science class is experiments. Probably the like astronomy, like things in outer space and stuff. Pretty much any experiments that are fun or taste good. Um, I like the physical changes because that's like a hands-on project where you can see like the melting point and stuff like that, like whenever it actually dissolves. I like stuff like that. I like biology and how people and other animals interact just because I like working with people and I love animals, so. Probably the visual demonstrations because and you actually see what's going on. Like getting to watch baking soda and vinegar react together. Learning about animals, their habitats, and where they come from, different species. My favorite part is probably relating all the experiments that we do into real life situations. Probably astronomy and the stars. Learning about uh, the indigenous rock, the metamorphic rock, or the sedimentary, just the different types and what they're like. Well, first I got my Bachelor of Science degree, uh, undergraduate degree, and then I went off to graduate school and spent several years doing research. I got a master's degree and then a PhD. Then I went into teaching and became an assistant professor. Um, eventually I came down to Lamar. My degrees are from Lamar University, Beaumont, Texas. Lamar. Lamar University, <laughs> LU. Got my degrees in biology from Lamar University right here in Beaumont, Texas. Lamar University, environmental science. I love the Jason Project. I have become a better teacher because of the Jason Project. I've been able to expose my students to more concepts and bring scientists into the classroom that they would never be exposed to before. This video is dedicated to the memory of Samuel Smith Lord Jr., engineer, scientist, and founding member of the Jason Alliance of Southeast Texas. Welcome to Lamar University in this year's Jason event, Operation Terminal Velocity. I'm Lucille Faro from Vincent Middle School in Boma and an Argo co-host. I'm Ryan Keswick from St. Mary Catholic School in Orange and your other co-host. Today's mission on force and motion will begin with how to properly remove a tablecloth. Then we will watch National Weather Service researchers use buoyant force to lift weather instruments 33,000 meters into the sky over Lake Charles. Next we will see what forces affect our Argos monkey gun bullets. Then we will find out about the simple machines used to operate an airboat in an oil spill cleanup. Finally, we will see how centripetal force works and how to put it to use. But first, we need to find out how we use forces and motion in almost everything we do. Today we'll discuss how the physics of force and motion affect everything we do, whether you're riding a bike, shooting a basketball, or sending a rover to Mars. We will discuss the concept of inertia, which is the tendency of massive objects to stay put if they are at rest, or the tendency of moving objects to keep moving. Gravity is a very obvious force in our world, and we will see how gravity affects the motion of projectiles, which are any type of object thrown into the air. We will also see how centripetal forces keep objects moving in circles, 
whether it's a playground merry-go-round, an amusement park ride, or a planet revolving around the sun. Welcome and let's get started. Today we're going to investigate Newton's laws and forces and we're going to do it in the context of the tablecloth trick. I guess you've probably seen that done in movies and television before. Wait, 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 wait! I've always wanted to do this. And? It's actually not a trick, and it's all physics, and it really gives a good illustration of Newton's laws of physics. The object of this, of course, is to pull the tablecloth out from all the dishes with the dishes hopefully not coming with the tablecloth and falling on the floor. The first thing we'll look at is Newton's first law. The plate will stay at rest, hopefully, unless an unbalanced force acts on it. Let's try to think of all the forces that are acting on the plate. This is the plate right here, and this is the tablecloth, and so we'll take the gravitational force. There has to be another vertical force acting on the plate. If there wasn't, if this were the only vertical force acting on the plate, then the plate would accelerate downward, according to the second law. The table and cloth are pushing up on the plate. And technically, that's called a normal force. It acts perpendicular to the table and the cloth and the plate, just like gravity does. What is friction? Anyone know the definition of friction? When two surfaces are trying to move across each other, the friction force will try to prevent that motion of two surfaces. Now the two surfaces in question here would be the tablecloth and the bottom of the plate. So if we look at the tablecloth, as I try to pull the tablecloth, and I can't do it unless I exert enough force because of the friction. There's three kinds of friction. There's static friction, rolling friction, and sliding friction. That's it, okay. So right now, if the plate or the block doesn't move, we've got static friction. So the block or the plate is exerting a force on the tablecloth. That's not a force on the plate. However, it leads me to Newton's third law. Newton's third law says that if the plate exerts a force on the tablecloth in that direction, then the tablecloth must do what? I hear they're all saying it, exert a force this way. So the whole idea of the trick is you don't want much friction. You've got to be able to concentrate and get that tablecloth moving as fast as you can so the acceleration doesn't take place for a very long time. You don't want to stop in the middle and slow down. It has to be one quick motion. There it is. Do you think you could do it? No. I think you could. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> okay. Now, that's a good illustration of what happens if you don't do it fast enough. Yes, that is perfect. When we got the tablecloth and we had to pull it, because it, it was cool how everything just stayed in the same place. Yes. It's funny to just yank the tablecloth out, making anything fall. Well, I learned about the gravitational pull and, and friction of how, to, um, how the, the dishes stayed on the table. How would you pull the cloth from under a lot of dishes on a regular long table? Just a snap wouldn't do it if you had a long table that was set. A lot of times, formal tablecloths have a lot of nap to them, and they have more friction, and that's another problem. If you practice with a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer, that'd be the best way to do it. Would like a graded tabletop at like outdoor places, would that make a difference? Usually the outdoor places, the surfaces are surfaces that weather good, 
and they're rough surfaces, and that would be a big problem. I think it'd just about be impossible. Picnic tables and things like that. If you had one of those um, plastic picnic tables, I think that would work pretty good because that'd be quite a bit like this. Would it work the same if you had a circular table that's kind of wide? Circular table would present some problems, and the main one is that the tablecloth would tend to bunch. It's hard to keep it straight here, and when it bunches, you tend to have the cloth grab onto the dishes with a force in addition to the friction force. I didn't like the adrenaline rush. <laughs> <laughs> I liked learning all three of Newton's laws because I didn't know them before. How many laws of motion is Newton known for? Is it A, one, B, two, or C, three? Think it over. The correct answer is C, three. Welcome Argos, I'm Todd Moggett, I'm the Observing Program Leader here at the Weather Service Office at Lake Charles. Uh, today we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch a weather balloon. Have, has anybody ever dealt with a weather balloon or seen one? Never ever, huh? All right. We launched the weather balloons, we're collecting data of temperature, relative humidity, wind direction and speed, and pressure. Now we are one of 92 offices in the United States that launch these weather balloons. All of us do it twice a day, six in the morning and six in the evening. And then in the winter time, we launch five in the morning, five in the evening. This is the instrument that's gonna be sending us data. It's called a radio sign. So if you look at this, this boom right here, that's a temperature sensor. And then in here, when I take off this cap, this is a hygrister. And all it is is a carbon-coated piece of plastic, and that's going to give us our relative humidity. Now inside here, there's also a capacitance barometer, and that'll give us our pressure. And then for our wind direction and speed, we'll be using GPS. There's actually a little GPS unit in here. So what we're going to do here today, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to let you guys do a little bit of hands-on. We'll go out and we'll launch the weather balloon. Y'all heard me say we're using hydrogen, right? Yeah. Now, what do we know about hydrogen? So this balloon starts off, it's going to be six foot in diameter. Now, does anybody have any idea what's going to happen as it goes up and gets up to around 100,000 feet? You know, your pressure is actually going down. There's less, there's less push on the balloon. So it's just basically going to start expanding. That's what causes it, is the pressure. Stop filling it up. Okay, what we've got is we've got these weights on here. Mm -hmm. All right, now we, what'll happen is it'll, once it lifts it up, it'll shut it off. Ninety-two National Weather Service offices send radio sounds up 33,000 meters through the atmosphere every 12 hours. They could use rockets or special airplanes, but an easier way to do it is to use the buoyant force of our atmosphere. 
Air is about 30 times denser than hydrogen, so buoyant force causes the hydrogen-filled weather balloon to rise and lift its radio sod to an altitude of 20 miles. The most interesting thing I learned about today was that they don't use helium to blow up the balloons, it's actually hydrogen. I thought the only way that you could blow up a balloon was with helium. I didn't know you could use other gases. Why do you fill the balloon with hydrogen instead of another gas like helium? Because hydrogen is so flammable. Probably the biggest thing is we can make our own hydrogen. Helium in general, it, it usually costs a little bit more. Another thing about helium is it comes from the radioactive decay of rocks. And you know, our supply is dwindling. It's not a renewable resource. How much do weather balloons cost? The ones we're using right now are about 30, around $35 a balloon. Now, the launch we did tonight with all the equipment included, you know, like the radio sound, the strength, even the parachute, it costs a little over $300. So now when you think about 92 offices doing this twice a day and at a cost of over 300, it's pretty expensive. Has a weather balloon ever fallen right back exactly where it was launched? I've been here since 1994 and the closest, it was about a quarter mile away. And we've been doing these weather balloons for over 50 years. Now there's 920 offices around the world. So I would say, yeah, the odds are that it's happened several times. The National Weather Service puts which gas in its weather balloons? Is it A, air, B, helium, C, hydrogen, or D, oxygen? The correct answer is C, hydrogen. Welcome Argonauts to the Department of Physics. I'm George Irwin and I'm going to uh, tell you about gravity today. When you throw an object into the air, any kind of an object into the air, it follows a particular path that is determined by basically Newton's laws of motion and gravity. If you take an object and drop it, then it will gain approximately 10 meters per second every second that it falls. After one second, if you drop an object, it'll be moving at 10 meters per second. And after five seconds, it will be moving at 50 meters per second. If I throw an object at two meters per second, then this shows the trajectory that it will follow every 0.05 seconds. So every 20th of a second, um, this will show where the object will be. The distance that an object will fall from the straight line trajectory that would have without gravity, the zero g trajectory, is always the same. After a given amount of time, an object always falls the same distance from the zero gravity line. So that if, even if I threw my projectile up into the air at an angle, it would still follow a trajectory as indicated. So here's the problem. There's a monkey hanging in a tree, but some distance away, there's a hunter. And the hunter has his gun pointed right directly at the monkey. The instant that the hunter shoots his bullet, the monkey lets go. So in principle, the monkey gets hit. Let's go ahead and hang the monkey. We have a way of doing that. I'll give it a shot here. That was a hit, wasn't it? Okay, let's try it again. Oh, oh that was a hit. hit. That oh. was a hit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right, all right. Contact. Yes. All right. How would air resistance factor into the monkey bullet? The way air resistance would affect the monkey bullet is that it would slow it down and fall a little bit low. How do Newton's laws affect the monkey bullet? 
The way that Newton's laws affect the motion of the monkey bullet is by providing a constant acceleration down at all times, regardless of its trajectory, whether you initially launch the bullet up or down or any kind of a projectile, the acceleration of gravity always points down. And so that provides a constant acceleration down. So no matter how fast it's going, it always will drop a meter after 0.45 seconds. How does our discussion of projectiles apply to orbits? Isaac Newton suggested that if you threw an object from a high mountain, it would, of course, fall down according to the parabolic trajectory. But as the Earth curved, eventually it would curve out of the way in such a way that it would go all the way around the Earth. And that's basically what we call a satellite orbit. So you can always think of the curved parabolic path that a football makes or a baseball or uh, any object as being the first part or the, the edge of an orbit. Is it possible to make a monkey gun using household items? What we have here are fairly common items. Uh, this isn't just a bicycle pump that provides the air pressure to shoot the monkey gun. This is just some ordinary rubber hose. This is a metal pipe. I think it's made of brass, but I think a copper pipe or a steel pipe would work and a little bit of copper sheet metal and some nuts and bolts here to make this arrangement. The power supply needs to provide probably a couple of amps, maybe this provides a couple of amps at about 10 volts. And there's a long wire that we use that goes up to the electromagnet and that was just wound by taking insulated wire and winding it around a bolt. So most of these items I think are fairly common. Of course, the monkey is easy to find. Okay. So what causes the monkey and the bullet to fall? Is it A, centripetal force, B, gravity, or C, buoyant force? What do you think? The correct answer is B, gravity. Great job. Simple machines like this are all around us. They impact nearly every aspect of our daily lives. When the ecosystem of our marshes is threatened, the Texas General Land Office's oil spill response teams have a big job to do. Join us as the Argos discover how they perform that task through the use of simple machines. What we're going to do today is show you a little bit about how a oil skimmer works. It works on the idea that oil adheres to things like oil, or things that are made from oil, in this case uh, plastic or polypropylene. And for this, we're going to need you to have gloves on and eye protection. I'm going to go ahead and pour our oil into our little tray here. Now most oils will float on the surface of the water. And as I said, oil sticks to things that it likes, such as plastics. The oil's back here, it sticks to the drum and gets scraped off by the wedge-shaped scraper. One of the other things that I want to show you here is, is a absorbent pad. These are used primarily on small spills. Not the deep water horizon spill, but the everyday spills we have in our waterways here. And what's unique about this is this will pick up oil, but it won't pick up water. We call it an oleophilic hydrophobic process. It's oil loving and water repelling. We've been on spills here that lasted three weeks to clean up, but that's, you know, we'll get the majority of it up in a week or two, but 
after that cleaning the grasses the plants the, the crevices that the oil got into we have an estimate that about 80 percent of the species in the ocean either grow up in the marsh or eat something that grows up in the marsh so if we lose our marshes we lose the beginnings of our food chain so this is a very important area and we need to protect it what we try to do is try not to contaminate the areas we're in so you'll see it sometimes if we're, if we're working in this area you'll see a slide pretty much everything in plastic so when we bring it up out of the water we don't oil up the docks, we don't oil up the ramps, we don't oil up the area we're in. Yeah, we're going to show you a big drum skimmer in motion, but without the oil this time, okay? What causes oil spills? The majority of oil spills in this area are inattention to duty. The second is equipment failure, and that would be like a gasket rupturing or a pipe leaking. What's the largest oil spill that has been out here? Well, Mackenzie, the largest oil spill since I've been here is called the Eagle Atomi spill. That was a 10,000 barrel spill, not gallons, barrels. Each barrel is 42 gallons. Okay, that happened just south of here on the Natchez River in Port Arthur, Texas, when a ship moving inbound, loaded full of oil, and a barge collided, and the barge tore a hole into the tanks of the ship, spilling out 10,000 barrels of oil. Are there any endangered animals that could be harmed or were harmed during oil spills? On the Eagle Atomic spill, no, we didn't have any that were threatened or endangered. But in this area, the osprey is an endangered bird that uses that marsh and eats the fish that would be affected by the oil spills. When was the most recent major oil spill out here? The Eagle Atomic happened in January 2010 here, and that was the last major oil spill we had. Now, we average about 1.4 spills a month in this area. Now, compared to 20 years ago when we averaged about 33 spills per month. Here's another question. Oil spill pads are made of oleophilic fabric. That means they A. Feel like oleo B. Love oil or C. Hate water. What do you think? The correct answer is B. Love oil. Nice going. An automobile going down a roadway like this, in order to keep from sliding off the side, there has to be a force, the centripetal force, that keeps it going in the circle, and that's always directed towards the center. Now, in this case, this is the friction on the road, pushing sideways on the tires. And if you hit a patch of ice, you lose friction, and then you slide off the road. You would go in a straight line. If the vehicle is going fast enough, it'll be able to make it around the circle and not come off the track, like that. It's clear that it needs to have some speed, some minimum amount of speed when it comes around here, right? If it's to lose contact right here, if you look at the minimum speed, that's where it just loses contact. And now there's nothing pushing in on it anymore. When that happens, when you lose contact with the roadway like this, well, you fall off the road. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Do you like going to the fair? Mm -hmm. You like amusement park rides? Yes. You know how there are some rides, they're like roller coasters that take you around a loop kind of like this, and yet you stay in your seat, right? 
we have a, a little demonstration of that right here. And if I get it going at just a high enough velocity so that when it gets up to here, then he'll stay on like so. Now, if he is going fast enough, let his friend join him there, then I can even rotate this upside down like so. And you can see that they're hanging because friction is holding them up because there's enough force towards the center of the circle, the centripetal force, to give them enough friction that the frictional force up will be at least as much as the weight that wants to pull them down. But what happens if it's not rotating fast enough? And they'll slide off. Aww. What provides the centripetal force to keep the Earth revolving around the sun? The force that keeps the Earth revolving around the sun is the force of gravity that the sun exerts on the Earth. The Earth goes around in a circle, and it has a speed, and there's always a force of gravity pulling the Earth towards the center of the circle, and that's what provides, at all points, the centripetal force that keeps the Earth going around in a circle. What would happen to the Earth if the sun's gravity suddenly stopped? If the sun's gravity suddenly stopped, and Earth no longer had the sun pulling on it towards the center, then the Earth would continue to go off into space in a straight line. How can you create artificial gravity on a space station? One way to create artificial gravity on a space station that isn't science fiction, but uses real science, real physics, is to make it rotate. If you made a space station that was basically a cylinder that rotated around an axis, then people could walk around on the inside like there was gravity. And this is actually how they did it in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. They had a rotating space station where people would basically walk around on the inside of a rotating cylinder. And that's real physics. That would actually work, um, unlike most science fiction movies where they don't explain how they make artificial gravity at all. What provides the centripetal force to keep you on merry-go-round? The centripetal force that keeps you on a merry-go-round is a lot like the force that keeps a car going around a curve. It's friction. It's friction between your backside, basically, and the merry-go-round. Friction has to be able to provide a force inward to keep you moving in a circle. And if you go too fast, friction won't be able to keep you in the circle. And you'll basically, it'll appear like you're sliding off, but it's really Newton's first law making you want to go in a straight line. In which direction is centripetal force directed on a curved path? Is it A, forward, B, backward, C, away from the center, or D, toward the center? Think it over. The correct answer is D, toward the center. Thanks for coming to this year's Jason program. Remember, Jason needs Argos like you for National Jason missions. If you would like to apply to be a National Argo, visit the Jason website at www.jason.org for details. And be sure to come back for next year's Jason event on oceans and climate.